Welcome to the UCLA Getty Conservation Program's Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Darnell Hunt, Dean of Social Sciences at UCLA. UCLA's longstanding partnership with the Getty has only strengthened the program through our shared mission of community engagement and education. That shared mission adheres to our motto in the social sciences, engaging LA, changing the world. The UCLA Getty Conservation Program continues to be a leader and not only advancing the preservation of cultural heritage materials, but in expanding access to the field of conservation by offering training, workshops, and mentorships to underrepresented populations. We are very pleased to have Janelle Austin with us today to speak about her leadership in the area of race relations and cultural preservation as founder and director of the Racial Agency Initiative and co-founder and lead caretaker of the George Floyd Global Memorial. It is now my pleasure to introduce the director of the UCLA Getty Conservation Program, Professor Glenn Warden. Thank you for the introduction, Darnell. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that as a land grant institution, UCLA and the UCLA Getty Conservation Program acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South, South Channel Islands. Los Angeles has the largest population of Native Americans and indigenous people of any city in the US and multiple programs at the university now engage with members of the Gabrielino Tongva tribe to share knowledge and work to address the decimation of the Tongva population in the 19th century. Now, I'm very happy to welcome everybody to another event in our distinguished lecture series. Given the size of the audience, we won't be able to interact with live questions or even through chat. Instead, I invited a colleague, conservator Anya Dani, to engage in a discussion with Janelle Austin and I following her lecture. Before I introduce the two of them, I'd like to just say another word about our program. Uh, we're the only conservation program in the Western United States and the only program in the country that focuses on archeological and indigenous materials. We offer MA and PhD degrees in the study of conservation of cultural heritage. And our primary values include diversity, collaboration with representatives of cultures associated with the objects in our care, and sustainability. Our intention with this series is to highlight how cultural heritage conservation engages with larger social and political issues. Speakers in the series are not conservators, but we ask them to reflect on cultural heritage conservation from the viewpoint of their own work. The title of Janelle Austin's lecture is A Sankofa Moment, Heritage Conservation and Racial Ju Justice at the George Floyd Global Memorial. We're very fortunate to have her with us today, given yesterday's dismantling of the memorial by Minneapolis city staff and subsequent protests. Hopefully she'll tell us a little bit about what's going on right now. Um, and she's actually in her car um, and probably at the George Floyd Memorial, but we'll hear soon. Uh, Jan Janelle is co-founder and lead caretaker of the George Floyd Global Memorial, where she guides a team of volunteers to stand in the unique space of preservation and protest. She's also the creator of Racial Agency Initiative, a racial justice leadership coaching LLC. And I invite you all to have a look at the, the great website and the work that she's doing through the Racial Agency Initiative. She began tending to George Floyd's memorial during the first week of the Minneapolis uprising as a form of social resistance and self-care. Janelle earned a BA in Christian Ministries from Messiah College, a Master's in Divinity in Ethics, and an MA in Intercultural Studies and from the Fuller Theological Seminary. She consults and speaks nationwide on various topics as they intersect race in America. A native resident of Minneapolis, Janelle continues to serve and be supported by the people in her community. And Anya Dani has worked at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Okinawa, Japan since 2011, where she established an art conservation program that partners with local museums and artists 
on the conservation of Okinawa's cultural heritage. She received both an MA, an MS and a BA in art conservation from the University of Delaware and has more than 20 years of experience working in cult the cultural heritage sector. Anya is co-chair of the American Institute for Conservation's Equity and Inclusion Committee and a co-founder of the Black Art Conservators Organization. And she's a leader in our field to end systemic racism in cultural heritage conservation. So with that, I welcome Janelle Austin to our Zoom stage. Hello, thank you for inviting me into this space. Um, I'm excited to be here um, and be present with you all. Um, as it was stated in my introduction, I am actually in my car right now. And the reason why I'm in my car is because I am at George Floyd Square and we had a extremely traumatizing incident yesterday where the city decided that they were going to reopen the streets um, using um, a community organization uh, called Agape. And um, it, it, everything started around like 3.30 in the morning yesterday. Um, and so yesterday was an extremely long and traumatizing day. And so today it's, it's kind of day two of season two of George Floyd Square here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, but it is a grand privilege to be with you all today. Um, I have, like, I, I actually had a pull that I, I was gonna be on my phone, but then I was getting too many text messages and calls. And so I'm like, okay, let me be present with my friends here at UCLA today, um, because I'm really excited to talk about this very important conversation. Um, and I actually am gonna begin um, with showing you all an image of the Sankofa bird. Now, this particular image comes from uh, an installation here at George Floyd Square. Um, the Sankofa bird comes from the West African, uh, West African tradition, and it's been adopted by many African Americans uh, within uh, the country. And what you'll notice is that the bird has its feet facing forward with its head looking back. And it symbolizes this understanding that in order for us to understand where we are going, we have to be able to first look back and know where we have been and where we have come from. Um, and so I want us to for two seconds to look back to the very first uh, day of the Minneapolis uprising and the protests. So this is May 26, 2020, where people started gathering um, and laying down teddy bears and flowers and protest signs. Um, and plants and rocks and candles and balloons to acknowledge the lynching of George Floyd that has now been officially deemed a murder by the state. And um, in this image, you will see people gathered. You will see the protest signs, no justice, no peace. Um, you'll see the name of George Floyd being evoked, you'll see ideas and feelings of what people were going through and what people were thinking. Um, now the memorial started small and it began to grow and grow and grow to the point where it was covering an entire um, two sides of a, a city block. Um, and it covered the in center of the intersection and artists kept bringing more images. And then before we knew it, um, the billboards were being um, commandeered by black art. And there was chalk art and street art all over the ground. Um, and what was happening in that moment was the people, the people were processing their grief the people were processing how 
to understand the context of COVID where we were all sequestered in our homes and um, not allowed to go anywhere, not allowed to touch anyone, not allowed um, to be present um, outdoors, except for like one time a day, or we had to get in long lines for the grocery store. If you were in a nursing home, um, you couldn't uh, have visits with your loved ones. And it was a difficult time for humanity. And in the midst of the context of that time, um, we hear the story of Ahmaud Arbery, going for a run and then being chased down by vigilantes and shot to death. We hear the stories of Breonna Taylor, who was sleeping at home and uh, a no-knock warrant was issued and she was shot to death. Um, and later her assailant was convicted for the bullets put in a wall, but not for the bullets put in her body. Um, we heard the story of Sean Reed um, and so many others that were being uh, murdered by police or people who thought themselves to have the power of the police. And by the time we get to May 25th in South Minneapolis at the intersection of 38th and Chicago Avenue, which is about two blocks away from my home, uh, my childhood home where I grew up, and then I moved back um, at the request of my family to be present for this moment and this movement. By the time we get to this intersection where Derek Chauvin, um, along with three other officers, um, assisted in the, the lynching of George Floyd, and I intentionally used the term lynching to connect it um, with the disregard of Black life and the disregard of Black bodies that we've experienced um, for hundreds of years in this country. Um, what, what we find is that we were all stuck in this place of having to watch an extraordinary and excruciatingly long video of the life being taken um, out of George Floyd. And there was nothing else on TV. There was nothing else to distract us because of COVID. There was nothing else. Um, to uh, change the channel or flip to. And we all watched at the time, we thought it was eight minutes and 46 seconds that later came out in the trial that it was nine minutes and 29 seconds of a man die. And people grieved, which is a natural human response. I've seen a lot of protests where people get angry, but this one, people grieved. Um, and that's how George Floyd Square was built. It's built out of the creative expressions of pain and hope um, that people were using um, various mediums of art to be able to get out what they were feeling, um, what they were hoping for. And you know what? They didn't all come for just George Floyd. As a caretaker, I found so many offerings that are tributes to so many other lives that have been lost um, and through different kinds of violence. And what we found was as well, as we went throughout this year, as people in our community died to different kinds of violence, memorials would pop up in their honor. We have Murphy Reigns, we have Squigs, we have Nini, we have Drew, we have Gettums. Um, the names of people who died even before George Floyd was murdered. Um, people are memorializing our dead and, rem and memorializing the injustices uh, that we are experiencing. Now, I started caretaking on June 1st, 2020, and I just started doing it as um, um, picking up garbage, my form of protest, uh, to be able to make sure that the memorial was actually tended to, that the memorial was actually cared for. Um, and so in that, in that work, um, I had no knowledge or background of conservation at all. It was simply, um, how do we make sure that everybody's story is told and everybody's voice is heard? And we have two guidelines in uh, conservation. I call it street conservation. Uh, I don't know if it's up to the full standards of, of, of our conservators, but I call it street conservation. And we have two guidelines. One is everything 
um, is somebody's offering. Therefore, nothing is thrown away. And two, that the people are more sacred than the memorial itself. And I've been told oftentimes, like, well, why do you call it offerings? People usually do not call them offerings. And you have to understand that when I first came into the space, the community had deemed it a sacred space. And coming from a theological background and having studied different um, religions and uh, studied theology and studied sacred spaces, it made sense to me that it would be an offering that people lay in the context of a sacred space. Now, one of the other caretakers that I was working with, he once asked me, um, he said, are you spiritual or are you religious? And I said, yes. And I said, I'm a Christian. He said, oh, okay. And I said, are you spiritual? Are you religious? He said, yes, I'm a witch. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and so what we found was this space was also an inner religious space. And so using the language of offerings actually allowed us and shaped the way in which which we actually cared for everything that was laid down at the memorial, whether they would be flowers or potted plants or protest signs or eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with someone's drawing on it, whether in crayon or in marker, or whether it be a 12 foot by 12 foot, foot portrait of George Floyd done by a professional artist. Um, we treat every offering equitable because it was a human being offering their own creative expression of pain and their own creative expression of hope. And I think in the midst of doing all of that, um, what we found was the memorial grew as people knew that their stories were being cared for. I think there is something about seeing people tending to the offering, tending to the memorial. But as it grew and grew and grew, it eventually got too big and offerings were flying everywhere and the winds were taking things and people were taking things. Um, we've gone dumpster diving a million times. It feels like just to save offerings or chasing down the block uh, offerings that have been blown away by the wind, really committed to saving everything. Um, we then begin to store them in a bus shelter. We, re, we repurpose one of the bus shelters to be um, a, a caretaker's bus shelter. And we started storing offerings there. Um, eventually with all the like the summertime rains, it was way too much and we needed indoor uh, climate controlled caretaking. And so the Pillsbury House and Theater opened their doors to us. They were closed for COVID um, and they offered a space in one of their classrooms for us to do the work of our conservation. And that is when I met uh, Nicole uh, Grabo with the Midwest Arts Conservation Center. Um, she popped up, I had never met her before. And she found out about this through a friend of a friend of a friend. And I will never forget that we had every intention of just literally storing these. I had wrapped them in like, uh, moving saran wrap just to transport them and um, some of them like were wet or and some of them were dry we didn't know we were just stacking them we had about eight bunches and each bunch had probably about a hundred different protest signs and um miss nicole comes in and she says stop <laughs> uh, if we're gonna do it if we're gonna store them we're gonna store them properly and that began the work of of what is now called the George Floyd Global Memorial and doing art conservation. And was very important for us to also be able to center the stories of black voices and center uh, black art conservation. And so what did it look like to bring in volunteers from the community and people who were protesters to be able to participate in their protest by conserving the story and preserving the story. Um, we would say we are not the storytellers, but we are the keepers of the story in so many ways, just to ensure that people's voices are lifted and people's voices are heard. Um, and then in this work of making sure that we did that, we had to be very careful. So as a piece came in, um, we wouldn't just hurry up and clean it because we understood that cleaning was irreversible, um, thanks to the teaching of Mr. Cole. And, and so we would um, kind of integrate this work of our racial justice and our protests um, with this work of conservation that was new to us. And um, 
uh, the same way Nicole said stop, we need to treat the pieces correctly. I was saying stop, we need to hold space for these pieces. What do they say? What's the message on the piece? How do we hold space for the fact that these pieces have lived outside, first and foremost as protests in the center of an intersection that has been held off and blocked off um, by the people to take a stand for racial justice and to say, we don't want any more lynchings in our backyard. It's being held by community members. And so in that work, um, it was important for us doing indoor conservation and caretaking to spend time with each piece, um, to, to allow it to speak to us because we believe that these pieces actually carry the energy of the protester, actually carry the energy of the person who was grieving. It is, it is an extension of their protest. And what does it mean to honor that? What does it mean to hold that? Um, and so when we're cleaning, we don't clean everything off. If there's a footprint on that piece, there's gonna be a footprint on that piece. Um, if one, some of the pieces are extremely dirty because they've been caught in gardens and serve their protests in, in the context of gardens, and so we don't clean all of the garden dirt off, just really just brushing things that would loosely fall off on their own. But if something is stuck on there, it needs to stay stuck on there because it is part of the story of the uprising. It is part of the story of the people who have held space for over a year. It is part of the story of the protests of Minneapolis and St. Paul and the people who've come from all over the world to say no justice, no peace or no justice, no streets um, or just to simply say Black Lives Matter. Um, and so we honor that and we uphold that. And then um, I'm gonna take about maybe five more minutes and then um, we'll, we'll wrap up here. But uh, when we decided that it would be important for us to do um, a, a rememory experience. And so the George Floyd Global Memorial, it, it's not going to be, and it is not now, a museum. It will be a, re a rememory because the way um, Toni Morrison explains it in her book, Beloved, is a rememory is uh, points to this kind of experience where, where you re-experience what happened, but then also that re-experience commissions you to do something more. And so we want to build a rememory. And when um, the Chicago Avenue Fire Arts Center opened up their gallery to us and said, hey, if you all want to display some of the offerings, this was heading up into the time of the trial, I feel like you're more than welcome to use our gallery space. And um, we had our team, um, Akoma Gaither uh, was our fellow, and we were designing and planning like, what do we do? How do we, which offerings do we select? And it was important for us um, to select offerings that felt like, I think we said, would give Black people a hug. We wanted people to walk into the space and be able to feel it as a healing space. And so it was important for us to not include offerings that had the language like KKK on it, or it was important for us to not include offerings that had the language of like F12 on it. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it was important for us to not include offerings um, that we felt could harm Black people um, more than it would help Black people walking into that space in this time. Now, once we get to the, uh, the final version of the George Floyd Global Memorial, everything would be displayed. But we understood the context and the time in which we were in and saying, we are going into the season of the trial. We are going into the season of the one year anniversary. We are going into the season of Juneteenth. And we constantly live in this season and this threat of the city may reopen the streets. And so it was important for us to find the pieces that we felt centered black life, centered black joy, centered black hope, centered black voices. Um, and in doing that, um, we, crew, we picked two, well, at first we picked a hundred pieces and we put them up and folks were so excited and it looked like an amazing gallery. And then I walked in and they're like, you know, what do you think? And I was like, there's not enough. I'm like, this is a rememory. So if it's gonna be accurate to help us remember the uprising, uh, offerings have to cover every inch of the walls. And so folks looked at me like, that was a lot of work. And so, but they're like, okay, we'll go. 
And so we went and we dug for a hundred more pieces. And so we have just a little over 200 pieces um, in the pop-up gallery. Um, and it, it was just open through uh, June 19th, through the Juneteenth celebration here in Minneapolis and here at George Floyd Square. And so um, in, that, um, in that space, I told folks, I said, we have to remember the bus shelter because during the uprising, we actually put offerings all over the bus shelter and it became kind of like an introvert space. And I'm like, we need to recreate the bus shelter. So when people walk in, they don't feel like they're in a gallery, but they feel like they are re-experiencing the uprising because that is the way people will be commissioned to do something more. And I'll never forget the day that we first opened and people who had protested during the uprising walked in and they broke down. They broke down because they remembered. They remembered what they went through. They remembered the pain. They remembered the trauma. Um, but in the midst of being able to recall that pain, they were still experiencing the hope. They were still experiencing the love. They were, they were still experiencing the imagination of children going for our future. They were still experiencing, uh, we had a recreation of the intersection um, in a, uh, on a pedestal that with that had original flowers from the street dried um, on um, and placed carefully del delicately on the pedestal there was a giant banner that was put up by a school that we had um, suspended from the ceiling there were you um, um, there are paper cranes also suspended from the ceiling so many paper cranes have been created and offered in into the memorial. Um, and so there was there were um, different um, offerings that still had their crumple or crinkle to it, or they still had um, the, the narrative of the story of living out in the uprising to it. There were so many different elements that people could walk in and see and re-experience and remember, um, even to the point of a sign that had the image of George Floyd and saying, uh, uh, and talking about sunflower seeds. There's a whole story about sunflower seeds on it. And so caretakers, we got a bowl from the memorial and then poured uh, sunflower seeds for people to take and people to plant. So everything is intentional. Um, and how we do conservation is extremely intentional for the preservation of the story. And I cannot reiterate, the even in the way that we did the, the pop-up gallery, someone had asked, are we going to put little plaques next to them and tell the story? And I said, absolutely not. And they said, why not? Because we don't know the story. We weren't there when someone protested. We weren't there when someone laid it down. And so it is important for us to be able to uphold the integrity of the story of each offering by allowing people to come in and identifying their own pieces and then offering the story for us to tell correctly. And so the way in which we do um, preservation and conservation of, of the story, of the culture, of the heritage, of this moment, is that we look back to see where have we been as a community? Where have we been as a people? Where have we been in this fight for racial justice? And then how do we do, how do we conserve and preserve the story that it is authentic, authentic to the narrative of the people? How do we preserve and conserve the story um, so the truth is told? Because you have to understand the way racism works in America. It is the commandeering of story and the retelling of story that racism anchors itself in. From the stripping of cultural garb in Africa and, and, and forcing people to ride naked across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, stripping people of their names, stripping people of their land, stripping people um, of their tribes, and then placing them on somebody else's land after then massacring their people or forcing a trail of tears and forcing people to work land and then trading people so they couldn't even be with their own families. All of that is stripping a narrative as a story, not giving people last names so they can't trace back their family heritage and narrative. All of that is stripping of story. And so the work that we do is to ensure that the story is authentic and the story is true. And it begins with conservation 
and preservation. And then it extends all the way into the moment where people can re revisit and remember what happened so that they can be commissioned con to continue to do the work of racial justice. We are in a Sankofa moment, but we have to understand that if we are going to get the story right, if we are going to tell the story correctly, if we are gonna honor black voices and center the local community, we have to be able uh, to look back and know what happened and honor the people who were there for what happened and honor the power and the offerings that exist as an extension of the people uh, who laid those offerings down as protests. And that is how, that is what shapes us and how to move forward in our work of conservation. So I'm gonna pause right there. Um, I know we're just a little over halfway in and so I wanna make sure that we offer excellent amount of time to be able to continue in discussion. Janelle, thank you. That was powerful. And um, I thank you for providing so much context for um, what you're doing there. Um, and, um, you reminded us um, not only of George Floyd's lynching at the site, but um, the many other lives that have been lost across the country. And that the George Floyd Memorial is not the only memorial, that there are other memorials that people are putting up um, um, and they're gaining national attention as well. Um, so I took a note of some of your phrasing. I mean, I, I started to note, <laughs> you are so good at phrasing. Um, one of the things you said was the memorial is an extension of the protest and that guides you in deciding um, what to clean, what not to clean and how to take care of these materials. I love your term street conservation. Um, I'm gonna add it to my own repertoire. I've been using the phrase community conservation and indigenous conservation, but um, I like street conservation. Um, you also mentioned that conservation is about preserving the story. And that was a real focus of, of what you said. And I'd like to pick up on that framing a little bit later in our conversation. Um, I've got a lot of questions, I'm sure Anya does as well, but I think what's really most on my mind is why are you in your car and what is going on right now? We all read that at 4.30 yesterday morning, um, city employees came in and started dismantling the memorial. Um, that must have been shocking um, given your work to preserve the memorial. And um, I, I guess, let me give it a little bit of framing from my point of view, but I'd, I'd love to just hear your response. Um, it seems to me that the, the site is a, is, is a very complex site with, with many stakeholders. It's at an intersection, so there are businesses or residents that wanna drive through. And I understand why some people might think that the memorial should be taken down so that you can get back to business as normal. And yet, the site is now etched in our national memory uh, and it must be memorialized. So there's a, a, a lot of negotiation that needs to be done to figure out how can the site be memorialized and yet honor the needs of, of local people. And it seems to me like the city made a real blunder that there should have been a process that would engage people in deciding how to move into the future with this memorial. But I'll stop, I could go on, but I'll, I'll stop. I just love to hear your, well, first of all, what is going on and, and yeah, your response to a, maybe a better process. Absolutely, you know, here's the thing that the, the city has had ample opportunity to provide a better process. We've articulated better processes. I mean, I've been asked over and over again, what do you think about the streets reopening? And my consistent answer is that the streets can't reopen until we receive justice. The reason why a protest exists is to uh, disrupt business as usual so that it signals to people that there is something wrong that needs to be addressed. Um, and the issues that need to be addressed have not been addressed by the city of Minneapolis. Um, and that can be actually uh, found and acknowledged by the statement of Congresswoman um, Ilhan Omar. She put out a statement yesterday that actually like validated 
the uh, the cries of the protesters for over a year and saying there needs to be some kind of restorative justice because of the the context of the situation that um, that led to the the lynching of George Floyd. In order for us to prevent um, more people from dying, the city has to take measures to actually repair the harm through systemic. Um, through addressing systemic racism um, within the city of Minneapolis, and they have not done that yet. So they actually, I saw like on May 12th, somebody showed me a plan by the city uh, to reopen the streets and to dismantle stuff all the way down to how they were gonna repot the plants. And I told them, I said, that is absolutely offensive that after 365 days, y'all can give me a plan for how you want to reopen the streets, but you're not going to give me a plan for how you're actually going to provide mental health trauma for the community, how you're actually going to provide um, job opportunities where there's job insecurity, how you're going to provide housing. We had people sleeping um, in tents during a polar vortex this winter. Like, come on, the city of Minneapolis must do better. They have not even fixed their police situation because yesterday afternoon, another person was shot and killed by law enforcement here in Minneapolis. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, to their surprise, um, the people showed up and said, no, you're not reopening the streets. And so they had, I, I got a call at about 3.30 in the morning and they said, they're here to reopen the streets. And I said, do I need to come? And they're like, not yet. And so I called another friend and, and who lives a block closer than I do. And she was like, I'm gonna take a walk. And, I'll, and we stayed on the phone while she surveyed the area. And um, she's like, I don't really see anything yet. And then another friend came, called me back and she was, she was stationed in the middle of the intersection. And she said, you know, they're about to dismantle the memorial. You need to come right now. Um, and so I went in and they were moving things around. And I just, I literally, I just walked up and I said, my name is Janelle Austin. I'm on the board of the George Floyd Global Memorial. Um, this is a sacred space and these offerings are insured. Um, and so I need to know um, what are you doing and you can't handle these offerings because you don't know what even is an offering and what even isn't. And at one point I bent down and I picked up the smallest uh, piece of crystal that someone had laid. And I said, this is an offering. And the guys, their eyes got really big and they were like, whoa. I'm like, yeah, your eyes are not trained to see an offering. My eyes are. Um, and then there was somebody else there who recognized me from the city and I called that person by name. And then um, that person came over and was like, all right, give this, give Janelle uh, uh, like a team and give her or like a, a, a yellow vest um, or whatnot. I did not wear the yellow vest. Um, I had a hoodie on, I put it through my hoodie and they're like, you need to wear a yellow vest. And I was like, I'm not gonna walk around here looking like I'm sanctioning the dismantling of the memorial. Um, they were moving bricks that were actually historical bricks that the gardener, when he built the garden, he took cinder blocks from rubble of buildings that had been burned down in Minneapolis and brought them to 38th in Chicago to, to um, put a barrier around the garden. And so they were trying to load those cinder blocks and take them away. And I had to stop that truck and say, no, where are you going? They're like, those are historical bricks. You cannot move with those. And they looked at me like, what? And like the fact that they didn't understand the historical nature of the space, um, they didn't understand the, the sanctity, nor did they respect the sanctity of the space. Neighbors were caught off guard. There was Murphy's Memorial and his family that's right in front of his family house. And they didn't know that that was happening. And they're coming with like these big barricades and saying, we're going to barricade this off. They barricaded off the gardens. They barricaded off the memorial. Um, and it was traumatizing. It was extremely, extremely traumatizing. I must have cried a million times, but at the same time trying to figure out what to do. When it came to the fist in the middle of the intersection, there was an offerings that had been there for months. And they, um, someone had said to me, um, they said, which now they telling us that we need to move the offerings because if the wind blows, because they're trying to create a roundabout and they have all these signs that said it would be a roundabout, but roundabouts are for traffic uh, but they're not for pedestrian safety um 
And so um, they're like, if the wind blows, what are you gonna do with the offerings? And so we started to pack the offerings but then, um, then they said, oh no, keep them there. They look really pretty. And I was like, oh no, uh-uh. no, no, no. <laughs> we are not gonna keep these offerings here for your aesthetic pleasure. I was like, strip the fist, um, strip it clean. And so we packed all of the offerings up and I asked them, I'm like, where are y'all taking these offerings? And I was like, you're not taking these offerings. They're under our jurisdiction. And so we actually took them to conservation. Um, they did run off with our uh, um, community defense guard checks at the, in every intersection. They, they loaded them up on flatbeds and they drove off with them somewhere. And so we're trying to find where those are. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a violating day and I've never felt so, um, I've never been in a place where I felt that I was like in the act of being violated and it, it, it continued for hours. Um, and so from before the sun got up, like, and then people started coming and it was just, it was an extremely painful day. It was in, in the trauma. So what happened to create an imagery of it, we had some community members who wanted the streets reopen and it created, they created a, a human made earthquake and a tsunami followed. Because what they didn't understand was how sacred spaces work. And the trauma that they inflicted on the community also was inflicted on their own bodies. And so I literally sat there throughout the day in the square watching people just act out and act outside of themselves. And they, no one could understand why, but it's because when you put trauma in the air, <laughs> it impacts everybody. And so yesterday, lots of people held space. There's uh, press conferences, there was rallies. Um, and then so today I'm in my car because we just don't know what phase two or what the next phase of the city is. Um, and, but I'm hoping that the response from the world was strong enough that the city is gonna rethink um, how to approach 38th in Chicago. My recommendation has been for months hold a community meeting where we have a consensus on designing 38th in Chicago based off of the design that the community establishes, not off of the design of a master plan of a city. Um, and the community and the people here are at least are owed at least that to be able to design this space. Um, and we also need to uh, name it as a historical preservation site. Like that, that is a must as well, because we've never seen anything like this in the last 50 years. And I don't think we'll ever see anything like this in the next 50 years. Um, and that's kind of where we are with that. Wow. wow. Well, <laughs> I, can I jump in? Yeah, just thank you so much, Janelle. That was really just amazing to hear. And I mean, it just sounds, um, so re-traumatizing again after everything that kind of you've gone through the whole year to just have to bring it all back and relive everything in such a traumatic way. I really appreciate you coming and speaking with us today. I mean, just given everything that's going on. Um, and of course, it's always great just to be in conversation with you. Um, yeah, so much of what you said really just hit a chord with me when you talked about um, Black art conservation, centering um, our stories, definitely, and how to kind of preserve, um, kind of really center Black joy, as well as, you know, having us talk about the trauma and the things that we have lived through, but also kind of keep it hopeful at the same time, and really thinking about how uh, Black people would experience the offerings when you created like the pop-up gallery, those feelings that you would have when you would go in. And to think about like how we would feel walking into those spaces, I think is something that a lot of places are not thinking about, right? When they create a gallery and you can go into a space and see all these images that are just, you know, really just strike you and make you feel so uncomfortable, but they don't really center like the joy as well and, and the hope so you can kind of look forward, you know. Um, so I just really appreciate everything that you were saying. Um, so I can really see conservation as a tool to help process, you know, racial trauma. And you know how when you care for these objects, it's really kind of like you're caring for yourself and for your community. 
And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how when community members have come and worked with you on caring for these pieces, do you see kind of like a change in them or kind of what are the conversations that you're having um, as that work is going? Do you see them kind of going through a bit of a healing process as they're processing the work? Oh, absolutely. Like we have had caretakers be in the middle of like a piece and just pause to weep. Mm -hmm. uh, because the piece itself is impacting them. And I think that's something significant and powerful. Um, we've also, I think it's also important for us to get black caretakers in the consecration space as well, uh, because they are able to interpret through a particular lens that I've noticed that white caretakers can't interpret through that particular lens. And, and that is, been important and so our work has moved a little bit more slowly um, because just trying to get the people who have the capacity to actually volunteer their time to do that um, has been a bit more of a challenge but I think uh, but it's still important it's still a value of of ours and I think that um, it's the the pieces themselves um, are extremely transformational and the process of working on the pieces are transformational. And my hope is um, that we can actually bring, like, y'all, I didn't even know our conservation was a field until all this started happening. So like, I learned how to like geek out over art science um, and, and, and find things that are like super cool about the way in which um, the sun has interacted with these protest pieces or the, the water has interacted with these protest pieces and, and how the formation of these, or even fire. Man, we had a uh, arson earlier this year and several pieces were burned. Um, and then but the watching the way in which the, the heat from the fire interacted with the pieces and how some things have created new pieces out of that. And, and then thinking about how do we treat this and how do we navigate this narrative and this story? Um, and I think it's, it's all significant and powerful and healing. Um, and I remember the day when one of our caretakers, she's a, uh, she's a black theater actor and she's also a photographer. And she reached out to me and she texted me. She's like, Janelle, I've been looking back at my photography uh, of my experience in navigating caretaking. And she said, I realized that these uh, offerings are going to be what helps heal us. Uh, here in Minneapolis and heal us as a people. And she's like, I'm finally seeing what you've been trying to say all along. And I think there's just something that we are privileged as caretakers to pre-experience the healing power of these, these artifacts and pieces, um, which I think, which is why we put so much care into the conservation work, uh, uh, because we understand uh, what these offerings have the power to do. So many ways I could go with questions right now. Um, I was really struck with Anya's phrase, uh, conservation is a tool for processing trauma. And, and I would like to think that that is what conservation should be doing. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're trained in materiality and identifying techniques and deterioration and knowing how to sort of technically intervene to preserve an object. But if we don't come from the culture that produced the object, we don't know the larger questions about well, why are we doing this in the first place? Or, and I think that there is more that conservation can do than just preserve objects for the future. It's through engagement, empowerment. And, and um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, look, looking into the future. Um, so I imagine that you're, thinking that there might be a, a museum or, or some kind of an institution where these works would be exhibited. Are, are you thinking, how would people continue to be engaged? Yeah, we want to build a, a rememory experience that would uh, like display all the offerings and people can continue to experience them. And that will be built slowly over time. This pop-up gallery will close down. We'll probably do another one with a new set of pieces because we've conserved 
man, probably over 3,000. Like, there's a lot. It's a, <laughs> like, it's, it's a lot. Um, and people, and we still continue to get more offerings. Um, so it's a living memorial. Like, people continue to add. People continue to process their grief. People continue to come. People continue to express their hope. Um, I think the concept of conservation being a part of healing process um, and allowing people to participate in that, I think it's, I think it's critical and important because I think, I don't think, and this is just me just engaging y'all's field for a year and talking to folks. I just don't think that the discipline of art conservation has really uh, allowed itself to get messy with the stories um, out of which the, the art comes. And when we've had fellows come in and to help us, like one of the things I had to tell them, I'm like, y'all, this is like a war zone and this is not a sterile environment at all. And so just beware like all the rules that you learned in school, you're gonna to have to toss like probably about 95% of those rules out uh, because, <laughs> because it's a different environment and people over property, the people come first. And so what does it look like? You may be working on something, but if something happens and the people are in need, we gotta put it down and go address the people. Like, and that's what's most important. And if you're gonna do conservation here, then you need to show up to morning meetings where the people are holding protests because you need to understand the protests that is currently happening out of which these offerings come and that they are supporting and are for. And so when you understand the offerings first and foremost as protest, um, that shapes things differently in terms of how you navigate it. Um, and so I think that like, street conservation is is the appropriate term because like literally like we like we're not working in a sterile environment we're making decisions on the street to say how much more how much longer can this piece live out here before it's blown away or somebody tries to steal it or mold gets to it and so making those conscious choices to say these things need to live as protests for as long as possible before we bring them in um I think that's a different kind of experience with, with art conservation and, and knowing that the purpose is for these pieces to actually um, look and feel used for their purpose. Um, and to accept that even like no matter how much it may make your stomach cringe, the fact that things aren't perfect or things are not gonna ever be perfect again or things are crumpled, um, or things are chipped or broken, um, and we're not going to reassemble it uh, because it's part of the story. Um, it's 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 a completely different kind of uh, art conservation because at the heart of it, it's story conservation. I really like that story conservation. I'm going to remember that. Um, some of what you're saying about preserving, you know, the dirt on objects and how it's been used, I think, you know, reminds me of something like archaeological conservation, right? Thinking about who are the people that have used the objects before. And, the, and you know, perhaps um, conservation can be a little bit more messy, right, when you're like physically on site and not in a sterile lab. So I think conservators can kind of get some of those concepts, you know. Um, I think what's okay. really, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is, is not so crazy, at least for people, you know, um, like me that come from kind of archaeological background. But I think what's really striking me is like the idea that you need to understand the protest, that you can go to the protest and come back in the lab, and that those two um, experiences are, you know, all part of conserving the story. And I think in conservation, there has been an idea that, you know, we need to be neutral and that we're not inserting ourselves into the story. But certainly, Janelle, you're very much part of this story that's happening, you know, and it's just, that's just the way it is. And it's totally okay. And I think um, our community, are, are, we're having conversations now about really being able to kind of express yourself, bring your background into your work and not just have to come in and, um, you know, just pretend to be neutral. But we all know what neutral really means. Neutral means more like centering white stories is being neutral, right? But we're having that 
that conversation now. So just one, I wanna say thank you for bringing this conversation to us. It's really excellent. Um, I was also interested in the pop-up gallery about you said people would come in and kind of interact with the offerings and then sometimes offer up their own story when they see their piece there. Are they are you able to record those stories in some way or document them? I'm wondering about like those stories as well as the, the physical objects. Yeah, we've provided different options for story recording. People don't necessarily use those options, um, but we have like a notebook uh, the, that, that probably gets used the most. We have a couple different notebooks for people to, to write their experience in there, whether they are one of the artists or not. Um, we just set up a photo booth, figuring out, uh, figure out how to work that. We also have like a phone, excuse me, a phone number that people can call and leave an audio version of their story that's used the least amount. Um, and so I, yeah, it's, it's, and I think once the protest, uh, once we've got some justice, we'll be able to do a little bit more active approach of like going out and, and getting people's stories. But we're also working on that. We've partnered with the University of Minnesota um, with their Youth Story Squad, Minnesota Youth Story Squad, to actually go out and collect stories. So that way we could do a, um, a virtual tour, a walking tour through the square. So that way when people come, if there's nobody to tell them what the space is, that we actually have the stories of the people um, that people can go online, maybe uh, click a, a URL code, and then they can, they can view a story map, but also like hear the audio of people telling their own stories um, or see the written transcripts of people telling their own stories. And so we're in the process of building that out and, um, and we're gonna do like a select number of stories now, and then in the future, add more stories and not just the stories of the uprising, but also the stories of 38th and Chicago as a whole, because there's a whole history here that leads to the uprising. Um, and, and so that's an important as well. So that's, a, that's the pop-up gallery. And then also a little bit beyond in terms of how we're thinking of the this, this space as a whole um, and, and narrative engagement. Really glad to hear that you're capturing these stories because as, as you've been reminding us over and over again, it is about the narrative, it is about these stories. And so doing oral histories or somehow preserving people's experience um, through them talking about it, it's gonna be really valuable in the future. So it's just really heartening that you're focusing on the objects as well as the, um, the stories and, and people's experience. Well, we're at the end of our hour. That sure went fast. Um, Janelle, I would just like to ask you, because we've got hundreds of people um, listening to us right now, what can people do? Um, is, is you have a nonprofit? Are there, is there a way to donate to help, help the work that you're doing? Absolutely. So you can um, give to the George Floyd Global Memorial. Um, you can go to gfgmemorial.org. Uh, gfgmemorial.org and that should take you it reroutes you to George Floyd Global Memorial.org um, you can donate there or um, I think also just like engaging in um, first of all engaging in racial justice in your own context like where I like LA I lived out in Pasadena for like a decade of my life when I went to grad school at Fuller um, and I know LA has its issues. And so what does it look like to get, in, if you're in Los Angeles, not saying that everybody on this call is in Los Angeles, but you're, if you're in Los Angeles or wherever you're at, what does it look like to understand the different policies that are happening? Um, understand what's happening with qualified immunity um, and how to advocate to actually end qualified immunity. That's something that we're doing here in Minneapolis. And so if you wanna get in on that, we can tell you more about that. Um, but, or things like having a Department of Justice investigations into police departments so people don't, so we don't want more George Floyd squares. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. We want people to live and live long lives. And so how then do we participate in the advocacy as people that we need? We have this big painted sign. That's gonna be the hardest part about conservation with the square is that we took over the speedway and 
people repainted it and said it's the people's way and we have this big painted sign that says where there's people there's power um and we just had a new installation installed yesterday of emmett till um tying these narratives together um and that was on plywood spray paint on plywood and so like really understanding how do we collectively come together as people using our disciplines um, and, and our work to say, how do we lend it for racial justice? What the Midwest, what the Midwest Art Conservation Center did in partnering with us was absolutely phenomenal. And it was them leveraging their agency for racial justice to say, we are an art conservation center and what does this mean for us to be a part of this major moment and movement in time um, and to lend our craft for the work of racial justice because we understand the importance of these stories being preserved and conserved and being preserved and conserved correctly because i can tell you that when Philando castile was murdered his stories were sent to the um or the protest art by the family was sent to the Minneapolis Institute of Art and it was curated incorrectly and upset the community. That's what started the formation of the George Floyd Global Memorial was the understanding of the history that Minneapolis got it wrong before. And we weren't going to allow them to do that again. We tell them all the time in building the memorial, I'm like, you can't be both the superhero and the villain. You can't go around killing Black men and erecting memorials in their honor. So the people must memorialize this moment through their offerings. And we needed the Midwest Arts Conservation Center at the time um, to be able to do it well. And then meeting Anya and so many other Black conservators across this country um, and hearing their stories and experiences and figuring out how can we partner with them long term as well, because we need black art conservators because their eyes are trained through their culture to experience and see the stories um, in a way that honors um, the black experience in this particular story. But think about where your context is, where are you at? whose story needs to be centered and uplifted because it's been historically marginalized. And I think as our, as the, in the field of art conservation, there's a lot of power. It's a, it's a field that is behind the scenes, but it lays the foundation of everything that is to come. And so what does it mean to diversify your teams, to diversify your institutions, to make sure that you're going out um, and centering the stories that are not being told and making sure that they're being preserved correctly and conserved correctly. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done. Um, and I think all of it helps us push our nation towards a more just country. It has taken us over 400 years to try to figure out this race thing and we still haven't figured it out yet um, and i think it's going to take all of us leaning in through our expertise um, to bring that together so one way you could like a practical step that y'all can do because most folks don't know where to begin what does it look like for if you're with a, a, a center for art conservation what does it look like to partner with a local activist group um, and say y'all teach me i teach you like a mutual aid kind of exchange to say, help us learn more about the narrative of justice that is needed in our community. Um, and we'll help you all understand how you can preserve and conserve that story. I would love to see more street conservation happening because I know that we're not the only folks protesting in this country. Um, and what does it look like to partner and elevate the stories that oftentimes go untold or go, or go told incorrectly because government wants to come out on top um, or people with deep pockets want to come out on top um, because people want to always be the superhero in the story. Um, but we need to center the voices of the most marginalized people in our communities if we want to be able to tell the story of history correctly. So 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now, people look back to understand where they need to go and they look back to a story that is told correctly. We are creating a Sankofa moment for our posterity. Wow. Janelle, thank you. You are an inspiration and you're right. We all have a lot of work to do. We need to partner. So thank you. I wish you the very best through this particularly painful moment uh, that you're experiencing right thank now. You. And 
the best to you for all of the good work that you're going to be doing in the future. And thank you again for giving us your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Janelle. And thank you, Glenn, for inviting me today. It was a pleasure.